Okay, so. Hello, everybody. Welcome to one of our five part series of the free technical webinar um, that we will be hosting. My name is Tom Zhang. I am the um, senior engineer for Optimus Solutions. And this is Mike Lyons, the Eastern District Manager. We cover Wisconsin, Illinois, Kentucky, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan. Welcome, welcome. Um, just to give a little bit of logistics on the details. Again, this is a webinar series that we've developed for um, our training seminars that we typically host regionally. And because of the current situation with the world, it is our new platform on um, online, et cetera, et cetera. So session one today is critical measures where, uh, where and process principles. And to begin, for anybody that is not familiar with our group, we'll go ahead and talk a little bit about our history. Uh, industrial Kiln and Dryer, Optimus Solutions, and Competitive Advantage is uh, three of six uh, separate companies under one ownership. This is um, a conglomerate of groups that help on, uh, that specialize in rotary equipment, two in asphalt, one Louisville dryer is the OEM, and then the three that I just mentioned, the service providers for industrial processing. Our business itself is um, very stable. We have no debt. Overall, we can supply as big of a project as you need or as small as a project as you need. Safety-wise, we are um, certified for all OSHA, MSHA, um, Safe Start, Haswapper, Tappy Safe, just about any of the normal safety standards that you deal with, uh, we will have. The overall support system that we have is that you as a customer have one, one group, which is the key account specialist, and then they themselves will work with you in, in terms of your local support parts. As long as you have one group that you can talk to, we're 24-7, 365, whenever you need, give us a call. So overall, um, one of the main values that we have is education. Uh, we go through in the, um, IKD University. We've had about close to a thousand people soon. Uh, along with We've actually had a lot of people come back for the 201 as well. Oh yeah? So that's pretty fantastic. Um, so overall, um, before we, I, I like to go through the company overview a little bit quicker so we can get to the technical details. We do have a lot of strength in engineering. We've got 3D printing capabilities, FEA. And the main part with industrial kiln and dryer and, and the, and the uh, surrounding teams and surrounding businesses is we have an integrator approach. And the main reason here is that if you have a problem and you ask us um, anything related to rotary, anything related to drive systems, anything related to the tooling, the lubrications, we are here to help you provide a solution. Solution provider. Solution provider. And this is just the final um, visual of some of the services that we do. Any of the field service that Industrial Kiln and, uh, Kiln and Dryer does, Optimus Solutions in Engineering Consulting, any diagnostics, we are here to help. Just about everything around the units. Just do. about anything related to rotary equipment. So get to some of the details. Basic vocabulary and equipment definition. The idea here is we all think, uh, I don't know about you, Mike, but anytime we chat with someone that has rotor equipment, if you're not super familiar with it, it's just this rotating can. You get a lot of different things it's called. That's for sure. It's not always a, a dryer kiln. They usually have a particular name for it. Right, right. Yeah, so, so it's just so understanding the vocabulary. Exactly. And what we'll do here is uh, um, we're going to go through a definition set so that we have a very common definition. And, 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 and it will hopefully help out with when, when people are calling in and asking us questions. You know, we can kind of relate to yes the, to the absolutely. Equipment, so. so to keep it simple for right now, um, 
we're, we're going to focus on the rotary dryers and the rotary kilns. Um, rotary dryers, you will have uh, direct fired, direct heat, indirect heat or steam tubes. And then kilns, you got a direct fired kiln and an indirect fired kiln, which in the industry, a lot of people call them calciners. And we'll talk a little bit about the differences there too. So the main point here that you'll see is the way the heat moves through the system, the mechanism of heat transfer that you need and the process that you use dictates the equipment that you either need, that you either need to buy or that you either need to make more efficient. And we'll go through some of those. Well, the drying process is going to dictate a lot of the materials that they're using yes. for producing. So. so here we have a direct fired rotary dryer. Direct fired means there is actually a flame inside the dryer. Uh, typically, you have uh, here this green uh, burner with the, with the fan. You'll have a burner that looks like that, and it's uh, okay. Oh, there's background music. Is there somebody? Okay, we let's see if there is a. Uh, any other noises? Muted. Okay. Sorry, guys. We got we got we got some uh, weird noise from some of our attendees. Okay. Okay. Cool. I, I muted everybody that that could potentially have noise on here. So we'll we'll go ahead and continue. Okay, so let's go ahead. So back to, we're actually talking about the burner. Oh, okay, the burner. So on the direct fire dryer, one of the key features is if you have a flame on the inside, there are um, some uh, flighting inside that'll protect the shell because these will be pretty hot. You get a lot of those called combustion pipe flighting. Mm-hmm, right. <clears throat> the next one, so these are very co uh, common for um, materials that you don't care if they get too hot, okay? So, for example, your stones, like your aggregates, your lime, limestones, et cetera. Correct, et cetera. correct. Okay, so the next one is the direct heat dryer. The key difference between a direct heat dryer and a direct fire dryer is that the flame is not inside the dryer. So, as you can see here, with the arrow on the far left, you got a burner and you got a combustion chamber. Anytime someone mentions combustion chamber, I think direct heat. Correct. And if you have the flame on the inside, it's direct fire. And that's a good illustration that we have showing everyone right now. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, I guess one question is why? Why does that even matter? Um, why does it matter if we have that discussion? Why does it matter if you have the design changes? So one of the ways is if you have a direct fire, let's say you're talking to us and you said direct fire it would actually make us think in terms of, okay, um, is your shell okay? Is your, um, do you have combustion flights protecting your shell? Then it's more on what, what mechanisms you have. What gives us the direction? Yes. Um, now, on a, from a design standpoint, a question may be, why direct fire versus direct heat? Well, one of the things with direct heat is you have a combustion chamber, so part of your dryer is not there to have the flame on the inside. Well, so you're protecting you're protecting the product. Right, and it kind of makes, if you have the same length of dryer, it's a little bit longer too, right? Okay. Another very common one, this one is used in um, distilleries, grain, grain. Yeah, anything to do, yeah, keeping, keeping the, or anything that's, uh, I would say, sensitive to temperature. Um, so, any because uh, the direct fire, direct heat, can be a thousand degrees, two thousand degrees on the inside. So, if you have something like corn, something like plastics, something that is sensitive to heat, steam tube tends to be a very good mechanism. Absolutely. Um, and and actually, overall, they're a little bit more efficient. Okay, so this is an, uh, a full scale model of a, or this is an actual steam tube unit. This is actually uh, one of the steam tubes in our uh, Louisville dry facility. Correct. I don't remember which one, but most likely for a go uh, corn or soybean manufacturer, because this is relatively large. Oh, hemp's been. Real oh, popular. yeah, hemp's, hemp's been real popular. So. Very popular. Okay, so we talked about 
some of the dryers, you have direct heat, direct fire, indirect fire, or indirect heat or steam tubes. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about kilns and calciners. So the basic definition for kiln and calciner is that they typically use a high temperature to make a chemical change. The rotary dryer, the main purpose is to dry. So if you have material going in, that's the same thing as material coming out, and it's just drier, that's, that's typically what a dryer do. Correct. If you have a kiln, let's say you put in limestone and you come out um, quicklime, mm -hmm. that's two different chemically, uh, two chemically different materials. Or say in lightweight industry, you put in a, a stone or an aggregate in, and it comes out as a bloated lightweight aggregate coming out, that's a different material with a different material property. Um, calciners, you'll see it for catalysts, you'll see it for um, other types of specialty materials. Not only with the high temperatures uh, for, the, for the materials, but you know when you when you have those type of temperatures, you're actually changing the shell. Right, the right, right, right. So that's where um, on a direct fire kiln, the flame is inside the drum, interacting with the product. Um, typically, it's much higher temperatures than drier, and the main heat transfer is radiation heat transfer. Indirect fire kilns, or uh, a lot of the people in the industry call them calciners, is a shell that is heated by the flame, and the shell heats the product. The main reason a lot of groups use this is um, if you can't have the combustion product right. from the from the mm -hmm. flame, if you have a very very specific atmosphere um, that you need. Another um, and another thing is a uh, because of that, because you're heating the shell and the shell's heating the material, it's like cooking, right? You, you got a pot, you're heating the pot, and the pot's heating the whatever you're trying to change. Cheese, macaroni and cheese. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> what that does is it makes these units, the cow centers, relatively small compared to the kiln. Right. I would say a kiln, you're in the 15 foot to 200, say 600 feet. 600 length. feet, six pier, five pier. Mm -hmm. So this is where you talk about multiple piers. Indirect fire, typically two piers, relatively small. And, uh, and you'll find a lot of your calciners even in more indoors as well. Yeah, more indoors and market-wise, typically in the specialty chemicals market. Right. Um, carbon black, plastics, um, catalysts, et cetera. And on the kilns, you got your normal uh, um, uh, larger groups such as a pulp and paper, cement, lightweight, uh, lightweight aggregate, your uh, pedal wine. So we can go a little bit more on the mechanisms or the detailed view of the pieces. So here you have an indirect fire calciner. The key is the heat is here at the bottom. You're heating the shell. And that's why um, one of the major things that you'll notice is you're heating the shell, you're rotating, and the tire is at the very, very end. So one of the things you'll run into is uh, uh, the shell actually deforming quite a bit. It's heating a oh, belly. Yeah. Absolutely, and you see a lot of change outs as well. On those. Yes. Um, matter of fact, uh, we're looking at doing one here coming up soon. Oh, well, so, cool. Uh, and then also too, you know, we're talking about terminology and things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times with the with the outer shell of those calciners, you know, they're either fire boxes, yes. hot box, or fire know. box, hot box. Mm -hmm. um, you actually have two different airs. You'll have process air, and that's typically what's inside the indirect fire calciner, and then say your um, Fuel air, your flame air, your heat right, air. Right. Right. Um, that is a that is something unique to calciners. This is a physical physical view. You'll see um, it. You here. You'll have a sprocket here. You'll have the tire here, and then this right here. Is, what you see is the tire box. And then on the right, you'll normally see either the burners on the side like that, or there's like a Big burner somewhere else, and you have the hot air coming through. And, and also, too, uh, the RPMs on calciners are so much slower. Yes. You, know, you know, so the drive systems aren't quite as big either. Right, right, absolutely. Uh, just visually looking at this picture versus the four, there's a major difference in size. Um, you appreciate the, the differences when you're standing in front of a gas. Yes. And also, it's a much bigger pain to work with because of the heat. Um, the because multiple piers. Yes, so. it is very, very hot on the discharge end. Um, 
Now, one thing is you're typically looking at what, four to 700 degrees Fahrenheit? Sometimes even higher. Oh, yeah. And typically, you don't want it higher than 750. Right, right. Well, I'm talking <laughs> down at the burner. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so another, another terminology that, that we'll go ahead and go through is parallel flow versus counter flow. Parallel flow means the feed and the heat all go in the same direction. The feed is going in, cool, and the and the heat is coming in hot, okay? So the air that's going in and the product that's flowing are in the same direction. Counterflow means they're opposite. Heat is coming in one direction and the hot air is coming in in the other direction. So let me ask you a question. You know, mm -hmm. it's been said in the past that, that you tend to have uh, more efficiency with the counterflow than you do with the parallel when it comes to drawing. Um, in a sense, yes. Uh, what that means is it is easier to heat something much hotter in a counterflow situation than a parallel flow. So direct heat dryers, you don't, you need a little bit more, more control. It's not as um, hot as a kiln. Um, those are almost always parallel flow. On a rotary kiln, your big cement kilns, your lightweight aggregates, et cetera, those are almost always counterflow. Actually, I haven't seen one that's not counterflow for a rotary kiln. I haven't seen one either. Okay. So overall, this section here is talking about just basic vocabulary. I just sure, want to make sure. sure that we're very clear on making um, what a cow sign is and, and the details behind it. It's not just a can. The main point is what you process what you need from your process. If you're chemically changing something, if you're um, changing the, uh, getting rid of the moisture, that dictates the heat that you'll need. Depending on the heat that you'll need, that dictates the style and size of the rotary equipment. Sure, sure. Okay. All right, so we've talked a little bit about definitions. We've talked a little bit about um, the vocabularies behind it. So now let's go into a little bit more of the meat of the, of the wear principles, okay? So I want to talk a little bit on the mechanical wear principles, and I want to talk a little bit about the process principles. Now, we are going to briefly go through a lot of these concepts, and it does not uh, mean we've covered all of it. I've actually... Sure. Well, we can only get so much. In the <laughs> there's, there's only so much you could do in a in an hour or so. Time sure, frame. sure. Okay, so <clears throat> this is a three tier rotary kiln. Okay, so how we know is typically more than two tiers. Uh, typically, rotary kilns that will have this type of style. One question is, what holds all the weight? These areas. This is typically where the tires are they typically hold the most weight right so overall here um if it holds the weight okay that typically means it holds um it bears the wear it bears That's where all the wear points are at yeah so i would say this mic is probably a spot that you work on a lot we do. We do. We see a lot. Obviously, all of our work is typically around the piers. Mm -hmm. so, uh, tire change out, tire rollers, rollers, shell uh, tires. Yeah. If you got a dog leg there, you, that typically means you have to change all of it out. Uh, you, you don't really want to have that there. It um, just depends on what we're saying. Depends yeah. on, the, and on the scope of, of repairs. So. Right, right. So if that holds the weight, that typically holds um, the brunt of the wear. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, you and of course, any changes you know that you see, you know, it's going to uh, with the process or mm -hmm. even conditions, and just you know, a lot of times you don't realize how much wear is happening. Sometimes, you just, right, it right. is turning, so you know, but it, it is wearing as well. So right, and and it's um, typically subtle. Um, when it's not subtle, it's a little it's, it's a little bit more obvious on what we need to do. When it's subtle, it's definitely, uh, it gets your attention. Right. So because something as large as a kiln. So. Right, right, right. So a lot of the rotary equipment is designed for a certain weight. Okay, so a lot of the OEMs design it for a certain Hertz pressure or the pressure between the tire and the roller. That's uh, called Hertz pressure and contact pressure. It's designed for a certain value of the tires, how much it can change from being a circle to something not a circle and how much bending stress um, the tires can hold. So these are um, part of the design set that most um, OEMs 
do in their calculation before right. they give you or give, give you sell you a new unit. But why is that important? Okay, why are weights a lot of times different than the original? Well, most of these units, uh, most everyone will have units that are relatively old. And if if your unit was installed in the 80s and now it's 2020 and you've been told that you need to what increase production? Well, usually when you see that, a lot of the, you, it's funny because you'll talk to the maintenance guys and they'll right, we'll right. blame it on the production guys. <laughs> They're just trying to cram as much in there as they can. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, so what happens is over time, your weight could change just because of your production. If Absolutely. you're at a hundred ton an hour and now you're at 200 ton an hour, that changes the weight. The reason why is a lot of the designs that I've seen now is they tend to design it right at that limit, uh, that um, industry limit that it's set. Well, I've come to you several times with uh, customers that have asked, how do we increase production? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> um, and, and that, Add weight, um, especially on the dryers, especially on the on the on the direct heat, uh, direct heat, direct fire, because those are a lot uh, high tonnage. Now, in the kilns, what's interesting is refractory. Refractory is a major, major uh, load bearing uh, set. You can have six inch refractory, nine inch refractory, or hey, you know what? We're going to go from nine inch to six inch. Hey, you know what? We're going to go from six inch to nine inch. And a lot of times, you think something that minor of a change isn't going to make a difference but it actually does yeah actually uh, on kilns what i've done on the on the load studies is that um the refractory is a major portion of the weight uh and if you go from six inch to nine inch on the refractory you've effectively had a 50 percent weight another one that i ran into this is more common in the pulp and paper market is if you've uh changed chains if you went from a uh, let's say more change to try to get a little bit better drying in that kiln and that end okay that changes the weight because the margins are relatively thin any small change let's say you had fifty thousand pounds out of a two million one million pound unit does that matter these are the great questions to ask uh, when you are considering weight changes and these are things that we can help you with that's one of the first questions we ask is this production rate when we show up on site mm -hmm. is to collect as much data as we can right right so let's talk about it a little bit. Um, um, in the industry, you'll have what is called load studies. Um, these are where uh, you take into consider consideration all the weights. We talked a little bit about the refractory. It's a little bit of, on the product, the production. Others are where the tire is, the weight of the tire, the weight of the pad, the distribution on the shell. You have heavy sections, you have thin sections, you have the gear. You have um, certain uh, dryers have, uh, like on steam tubes, you'll have the um, blue heads, Correct. you'll have the uh, steam chest, uh, and then you have certain brackets inside the dryer that matters. So there's a lot of different ways that weight could be added. And the first, first level calculation is what we call a, excuse me, a, a static beam method. This is what we uh, see in statics and dynamics uh, and civil engineering that you'll see. You take a beam, you take two or three um, uh, reactionary forces, you put all the weights in and it gives you your overall weight. Okay, so that's the first pass. Then we consider the um, structure of the tire. If the bending stress of the tire matters, and like I said it before, uh, Hertz pressure, that's one of the most critical ones that we see. Well, we, when we used to talk about that, it's uh, the shaft bending. Yeah, and, and also some of the shaft bending that, that we've dealt with, that's more on the dog-like side. So these are things that we can measure. And on a low study, these are things we can calculate. Sure. Um, here's, some, here's some good information. Uh, typical industry standard for Hertz pressure is 60,000 PSI. So if you don't know where you're at, know that. Um, as you can see on the chart on the left, here two is a little bit higher. Um, and and this is a a um, I think I did this one where they wanted to add a little bit more production. So as you can see, this is about original spec, and you can see that it's all designed at a very very tight window to that limit. Right. So let's say you move it up to seventy thousand psi. Well, now you could end up with fatiguing issues. You can end up with cracks in the rollers, et cetera, et cetera. And these are from mm -hmm. us. At calculating what an OEM would do. 
tire bending stress, typically it's a little bit better um, in the 8,000 range, or maybe it is 8,000. So the industry has a generally accepted under 10,000 PSI. Some of the groups um, like to design very conservatively. I know a Louisville dryer likes to design it very conservatively. That's why their systems tend to be a little bit more beefy in that sense. And I've seen some of the lighter duty types of units and they tend to be a little bit different. So if you guys want to know how your system is doing, these are ways that you can calculate it out via um, weights. And to me, these are just um, base physics related uh, uh, analysis. No, it's, it, it's good information to have, especially, you know, if you're seeing issues, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes, or if you want to make a change. Oh, absolutely. Okay, so we talked, um, we talked about the loads, okay? So a lot of the OEMs, you know, you got a sheet of sheet of paper or in a CAD file, whatever it is. It is all assuming it's perfectly aligned. And I want to talk a little bit about what an alignment is, what alignment means, how that's different. There's a lot of confusion. Absolutely, we get it all the time. Oh, we want to get it aligned, but you really, maybe you're meaning to track it or to float it, or we want to float it, but you maybe or actually- make cuts make cuts, right, right. There's so many definitions and part of this webinar um, today is just to get some of the terminology where it's clear. Sure, sure. And when it's clear and the communication is clean, we are all on the same page. Then if you do do a service in your own internal team or you do a service with a service provider like Industrial Town, it makes A, the pricing make a lot better sense and it just makes everything smoother. Well. Having everybody on the same page. Having everybody on the same page. So the first thing, adjust a little bit. The first thing is alignment is not the same as skew. So alignment is slope. Alignment is making sure the center lines all match the OEM or some predetermined values. The way I want to want you guys to think about alignment, especially the the groups out there that are uh, rotary kilns. I got an idea. How about we kind of use the dryer? Oh yeah, let's go take a look at uh, at a few things. So I'm going to go through this a little bit, and then we'll go sure, through and absolutely. take a look at the dryer. So on the alignment for the kilns, what you guys need to know is think of a straw. You know those straws with little bends. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So so if you bend it, it's not aligned anymore. Okay, that's say your pier three. So if you bend it to where that's straight, it is aligned. So think of make something straight on the alignment, okay? Skew, and we'll talk about a little bit on once, once to show you the drum, skew is a little bit different because what you're doing is you're trying to move the unit uphill and downhill, making sure that you have even distribution of forces on each other. And everything is thrusting correctly. And everything is thrusting correctly. Okay, so before we continue, we'll go ahead and show you some of our uh, cool stuff. Let's see here. Uh, take this. Hey Tom, this is Jason. Uh, yes, we have Rodrigo um, from Brazil. He was asking you about the Hertz pressure. Um, what could be our standard yes, for shaft deflection? Shaft deflection? Yes, he says some studies show about two, uh, 0.2 millimeter and 0.3 millimeter. He was asking if that was correct. So shaft deflection for a dog leg, and this is typically for uh, three piers or more on a kiln, 0.2 millimeters is normally the um, initial limit. That is what I would call a, um, a dog leg or a crank. So if you exceed 0.2 millimeters, um, when you do say a roller shaft ending measurement um, with, a, with the sensor and, and you put that where the uh, rollers are, 0.2 millimeters is where I would consider a dog leg once you exceed it. So if you're in the 0 0.2, 0 0.3 range, you effectively have a dog leg. Now, we can go a little bit deeper later on um, to um, outside of this, because that's a, actually a pretty technical question in depth, is that you also want to look at your peak angles. Um, because if your angle, let's say you have three um, tier units, if your peer two has a dog leg that exceeds 0.2 millimeters, the peak angle between Pier 2 and Pier 3, Pier 2 and Pier 1 should be about 180 degrees apart, okay? So hopefully that answers your question. <coughs> okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at the drum. So we have 
a uh, rotary drum. Hopefully everyone can see it. Yeah, I, I see. Uh, <laughs> cool. Okay, so before we go, let's start with this. So this is a what a typical two tier dryer. dryer. Okay. Um, direct heat, direct fire. This is about normal. Steam tunes, uh, you'll have some other things, but these look relatively similar overall. The first thing is on a float. You want to talk about float? Yeah, let's do float first. So let's or see. Skew. Yeah, skew. If you zoom in here, you see a thrust roller. Let me see if I can put a little bit of light on there. See that? So that's a that's a thrust roller, and the idea here is what they skew. You're just trying to make sure that it kisses off the downhill to give you visually the movement of the unit. Let's see here, uphill or downhill in this direction. Now to do a skew um, or a thrust move. Now this unit. Uh, especially when you guys are familiar with the dryers, this right here is not how most uh, uh, actually dryers will have this, but you typically will have a block. You have adjuster bolts. You have adjuster bolt here that you can actually push in and out. What a skew does is it takes this roller, let's see here, and it does this. Okay, that's a skew. So when you start moving bearings in and out, to adjust for thrust or get it to float or right. to skew, which is what you're after. Right. So what that does is that will actually move the unit in this direction. That's this is called the axial movement. Okay. Right. And it'll keep try to keep it between the thrust idlers. Yes. Yes. The main thing here is you want to make this and this as as um to begin with as neutral or as a... You want as much contact between the surface of the... Right, the and that's assuming both of these are clean and the slope and everything's good, okay? So for a skew, your main goal is to do this motion. That does not change your slope, that does not change your alignment necessarily. Now to do an alignment, this slope and this slope have to match. Okay, that's part of an alignment. So let's say this is zero degrees because it's level, and this is zero degrees and it's level. One of the things that I would call a line is this and this on the same slope. Absolutely. Okay. Now for a kiln, when you have a third um, third pier or more, now you're actually wanting to again, like my example, uh, making sure the straw is straight. This and that and this have to be in a straight line with the same slope. That's an alignment. So a skew, you're just moving this back and forth to move the unit uphill downhill to make sure everything right. is neutral. And then on the left, you're actually moving these in and out to raise or lower or move left or move right the unit to make sure it is straight, okay? So alignment is not the same thing. So when you call or if you have a question or if you talk to your colleagues, be cognizant that a skew and alignment are not the same thing. And if you mean alignment, uh, or if you mean skew, and he talked to us about alignment, that's a very different uh, piece of information for Absolutely. us. Absolutely. Okay? Anything else you want to show on this before? No, no, I think so. Yeah, this is just a cool unit you know, we just want to show you guys. because uh, We could turn it on, but we've been told it's very noisy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we may do that at the end. Yeah, we may do that at the end. All right, so let's get back to the presentation. <clears throat> Oh. <laughs> okay, so I got a question that said if we sold that uh, setup, uh, I don't know yet. I'm sure we can work out some details. Uh, Mike is uh, Mike is always uh, perfectly happy in uh, helping you out in, on that front. <laughs> Everything's for sale. <laughs> Everything's for sale. I mean, we've we've uh, sold some interesting things over the years. Okay, so again, alignment and skew are not the same. Um, I just look at my time a little bit. It is not the same, and we'll go through even deeper now. With that was a visual on the drum. Let's go through a little bit deeper on some of the data. Okay, so let's say you have a kiln that's four piers. Um, alignment again is I want it to be straight. Okay, 
the red arrows that you see or the red lines that you see are the limits for us it is considered misaligned if your unit is outside an eighth of an inch plus or minus okay an eighth of an inch is roughly uh, three millimeters a little bit over three millimeters um, if you are within that you're considered aligned I mean, eighth of an inch is really pretty tight. I think that comes out maybe six pieces of salt. <laughs> it's wow, yeah, it's uh, it's really tiny. Um, uh, so it's, I mean, you got these massive pieces of equipment, and your margins are relatively low. Yeah, <laughs> because uh, eighth of an inch, when you visual, when you visually look at a unit like that, you're like, wait. Eighth of an inch, maybe this much, right? Right. <laughs> okay. So again, you know, if if you want you want to keep the straw the same, uh, you want to keep the straw straight. This is an example of saying mm, it's a little bit at the edge. I would move the tire from the left to the right, and then you would be aligned. And and you know, uh, one of the things too is as, as as the slide here shows what to look for. You know things that you could see possibly see because of mis being misaligned right you know you're going to see start seeing the the wear pick up in component yes and i actually you bring up a very good point um remember um you start with the weight the unit starts with the weight the oem assumes it's aligned um one of the things that i'll talk about in about i think uh, a few more slides is we're actually integrating the misalignment in our models now to where you can actually see the effect. It's actually pretty amazing. It is. We, uh, we actually did a test run for a customer and uh, it was a, I think it was a five peer unit and our model showed that um, tier one downhill um, was going to have a lot of stress and it was pretty amazing because he uh, said, wow, it's a, uh, and this was separate. We, we just did it because we want to test the model out. Right. He said he had cracks at that same spot and it was uncanny that wow. we were that close. I was like, wow, that's amazing. I'll show you a little bit of the results. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you, know, you talk about the, the uh, misalignment, things like that. Mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that we definitely go over in our training as well. Right, right, we right. Bring people in house. Right. We'll go through the concepts of training. Um, we'll even go through the concepts of how to skew, how to float. And again, our limit is plus or minus 100 uh, uh, eighth of an inch or 125.125 uh, uh, thousandths of an inch. Now, what that means is our technology, our methodology has to be more accurate than that. So, for our instrumentation and our um, um, what we call kiln axis surveys for kilns and what we call dash scans for dryers, that means our accuracy has to be lower than that. I can show very easily now accuracies plus or minus 40 thousandths of an inch. And typically, the guys are in the 20,000, 25,000 range now. Wow. Yeah, and because if you, there's no point in having these limits if you can't be more accurate. Right. In most grooves, if you use an older, older photo station, you're in the plus minus um, two, three millimeters. Well, our right technology's now. gotten so much better. Yeah, and we can show proof on each of the errors that you can go through. So anytime you, you got one of our guys and you, the, hey, what's the accuracy right now? And so, oh, it's this, it's this version, and we're we're happy with the results. I mean, I, I love being able to show how you do a good job versus an opinion. Right. Okay, so this is an example of slopes. So this is um, um, relevant a lot of times for rotary dryers, cow signers, any of the two pure units. So, for example, on this one, the slope for the unit. So, on um, if you Remember the tire to tire, that's uh, 0.498. That's about half an inch per foot. And each of the rollers, 0 0.49, 0 0.51, these are relatively close. And especially for a unit that's smaller, this is a good number set. And what I don't want to see is 0 0.5, 0 0.498, and then at the bottom, 0 0.3, 0 0.35. Right, right. Then you're like, okay, something's off. You need to do something on the shimmy. Somebody asked if, um, in your opinion, what's worse, misalignment? Vertical or horizontal? Oh, that's a good question. Okay, so typically I would say horizontal. And that is 
because vertically your rollers are typically designed a little bit more for the vertical. Now, that is actually more or less based off of feel and more or less based off of um, some of the discussions I've had with colleagues over the years. What we can do now is show that. Well, think about with, with the horizontal <clears throat> misalignment, you're putting so much more pressure. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a very good point. When you're in a misalignment state, horizontally, if it's perfectly aligned, has a weight um, of nothing. Okay, you're not adding a force to the right, you're not adding a force to the left, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you have nothing, right? So that's good. Vertically, you always have a weight on it. So your system's already used to vertical right, right. weight. So that would be the logical thought process. I always try to use the analogy, and it may not be a good one, but just if you're ever riding down the road and you see a car or truck in front of you, and you always see it riding sideways. Right. <laughs> right. You're putting wear on their tires, yes. everything, you know. Yes. Well, um, well, the cool thing is what you guys can see on the picture, um, that's an FEA model. This one was actually heavily misaligned to the left. This is the under view because you see the trendians on the right. Um, that actually caused a lot of problems. So I rather show you which one is worse because it could depend on the loads that you have and other factors. <laughs> so if you guys are interested, we can actually do a load study. If you have alignment data, um, or alignment survey data, we can factor that in. We can do the alignment data um, by us doing a survey, and we can integrate it in to show you a model where you can do the loads and you can show the misalignment because both of those have factors. And I'm sure you'd love to do that. Oh man, we already did some, and I'm. Uh, it's really neat. Somebody else asked, "What is the angular tolerance for slope at a pier versus design slope for a kiln?" Oh, that's a good one. Typically, it's, uh, I want to say nowadays, 0.01, um, because, or that one's always interesting because it actually matters on the length. Um, the way I do it, if it's a kiln, you can actually center it to where it's a, um, it's a, it's a, it's a vertical misalignment. So that already factors in your slope. So if you take your slope and you take the slope change and you anchor it, say, at um, pier one or pier two, or et cetera, et cetera, that change in the difference in height, that has to be within an eighth of an inch. Okay, so um, I could just answer the inch per foot, but depending on where it is, that factor actually scales. I think a better metric is to center everything along the line of the um, straw in a sense, and see how the straw varies from that slope. That you want to keep within an eighth of an inch. That should show you details. And also, um, we could, we're, we're now geared to do even more studies on it to where I just haven't gone back and went through all the data and go through and see what the difference is. So the length of the kiln actually makes a factor into that question. Cool. But, one of the main things is why do we need to align the unit, okay? So the main reason you need to align the unit is circumferential cracks, okay? Um, if you have a high load, if you have issues with your refractory, with your tires, if, it's, if the shell is uh, flexing, those typically cause what I call an axial crack. It, it, it moves this way, okay? Uh, or left and right or uphill, downhill. When you are misaligned, you have potentially circumferential cracks, which is around the unit. When a circumferential crack mm -hmm. forms, you probably get a phone call. It's bad news. <laughs> it, it looks, you end up with a, <laughs> you, you a kiln in half or, or a unit in half. Or two yeah. kilns, right? Yeah. So this type of two kiln unit is typically not um, as useful as the previous one. Um, but yeah, yeah, that is why we do a lot of this because when you when we get customers that don't do alignment, you'll see the crack repairs 
or we'll see the crack repair. Like, hey, when's the last time you've done one? Oh, about three years ago. And, and, and again, there's a good list here of things that are going to start wearing because of the misalignment. And that's what people don't realize is, is how much it affects the rest of the components on the Yes, unit. absolutely. And that's, I mean, I mean, again, these are very heavy things. On the light side, you're talking about a quarter million pounds. On the heavy side, you're talking about two million plus. Yeah, I mean, think about it. If, if, if pads are, are meant to be replaced, yes. You know, but if you're trying to replace a uh, three foot wide tire, you know, uh, on a kiln, I mean, that's your, you're, you're, that's cutting, you're cutting 30 it, feet in the air, you're cutting it in half. And I mean, it's, so these are the things that could be prevented. Mm -hmm. by, and, mm -hmm. and really, um, it would, yeah, you have to replace it, but what about all the production losses? Because oh, of the shutdown, absolutely. Right. So typically most of the groups have plan shutdown and great, you know, plan shutdown is much better to do, but when you have circumferential cracks and then it's an emergency shutdown. Well, and, and one of the things that I feel like we do a pretty good job of helping customers with is preventative. Mm, yes. You know, getting us out there to do these types of checks is not that, you know, it's not that uh, costly. It's, it's right. things that they can keep track of. Right. It's trending information. Right, right. Because we're trying to get it to the point where we're not all firefighting. We're actually getting some data. And um, one of my philosophies has always been, I'm not a big fan of opinions. Okay. I like to just have some data, have, have a little bit more uh, of basic engineering principles and go, hey, five plus five is 10. We're not going to argue if five plus five is nine. Okay. It just is. Right. And when we go in that direction, it it doesn't matter. It's a very neutral discussion. Absolutely. So let's define skews a little bit. Again, skews is altering the role. If you look at it top down, a perfectly neutral roller would be sitting parallel. Like if you are, if you're on the, if you're looking down on the dryer and it's a railroad track, if you keep going, it'll just keep going straight. Okay. When you skew a little bit, you change the tilt a little bit say towards the left or towards the right depending on which direction it rotates is it counterclockwise or clockwise that will give you your thrust so when you're neutral everything is parallel everything is square but you uh um the only reason you would have a neutral is if you have say a cement kiln or any of the kilns with hydraulic thrust rollers you want it neutral and the hydraulic thrust roller will actually move the unit. If you don't have that, you actually want it to have a slight, slight uphill thrust. What, 5,000? At least. Yeah, At least. in that range. And it gives it just enough that you can push the unit uphill to where it's kissing off of that downhill thrust roller. And that's typically a very good spot. This will minimize your wear. This will minimize your uh, need to do a lot of maintenance as long as everything else is aligned. And, and, and speaking of the maintenance, it's, it's a good idea, uh, especially like maybe on the two fear units, mm -hmm. when you do get an outage, is to go through and neutralize and, and reset yeah. your, your support rollers. Yeah, you can um, mm -hmm. you can do that, well, especially with the dryers, the calciners, the, uh, uh, the smaller units. You can do what we call a sweep method, use a dial indicator oh. on the on the um, on the roller moving back and forth, make sure it's the same number or, or our T track or our T track. Right. Well, our T track. It's just an easy. It's an easy version of a dial yeah, indicator. <laughs> there's too many tools out there nowadays to to make things look simple. Right. Right. And then once you get that going, you then turn the unit on, let it rotate, um, um, get it to where you're in an operating condition. Then you do your fine tune adjustments. Right. Um, you should be able to do that um, if. If you don't, um, we have class that will teach you how to do it. Yeah. Um, if you guys always call us out to go flow your unit, then we'll be like, okay, you guys need to learn how to do that. Well, a lot of times, even when we're out mm -hmm. doing these, you know, we'll we'll ask for someone from the maintenance department to kind of come out and watch. Yeah. So they kind of get a good understanding. We don't mind showing what we're doing. Right. Because I I mean I think this is great because when you do it that way, you're teaching you're teaching some of the basics that each of the plant personnel should because you should be calling us if it's uh, some of the bigger issues where it's um, something that you don't have the resources for but if you have resources that can do these types of tasks it's a lot more cost effective and we don't mind teaching hey look i can do it anymore <laughs> absolutely okay so just to give a better illustration so first thing is an alignment you want to make sure you're straw straight 
what they skew to really drive home the message is this is a car that's on a hill. Okay, the example I always like to give. The car really, let's say it doesn't have any brakes. Somehow you got the car there with no brakes. If you wanted to stop the car, you would move the tire to the curb and turn the wheel. Or uh, I guess uh, the other example is I'm in a supermarket and I got that little little roller coming down and I'm trying to twist it a little bit right, or, right. or I got a stroller. You know, I remember my stroller kept going down and I twisted a little bit and it stopped. That is skew. That is you're floating a car <laughs> uh, because that car is at the same slope as the uh, the ground it's on. The uh, the car is aligned to the to the system. The car's slope is the same, but if you don't deal with the skew, the car just roll down him. Well, but what happens if if when you do have the skew and you've got one work, you got all these working against each other? What yeah. what, what do you what starts happening? Oh, then you have some issues. So I'm gonna go back a slide. You see that bottom one? Yeah, yeah just the wrong. That's what we call a pigeon toe. Okay. When you have a pigeon toe, the, the uh, top. In this case, the top of the picture, you're going to have that part starting to where this is where you talk about tapers. Mm -hmm. This is where that happens, and then you got issues, and then your rollers give out, and then you have to change your rollers, and then you have a series of unfortunate events. Right. Okay. So the first thing is if you identify the, um, the pigeon toe and you move it to where it's not, that in itself is very helpful. Be surprised how many times you see. I would say I, um, right now I see about 30% every time I, I do a, a survey. It's like one out of three. I, I see a pigeon toe. I'm like, hey, man, it's a pigeon toe. What? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that, that's pretty. You're trapping that, the unit. Yeah, and that's uh, actually, that's a lot for me. Yeah. Okay, so we talked about the, um, we talked a little bit about the alignment. We talked a little yeah. bit about low, we talk, loads. We talked a little bit about skew. Let's talk about creep, okay? Creep. Creep is the tire and the shell are rotating at the same speed, but it, or it, it's well, just a little bit slower because of the diameter. Right. Okay, it it ultimately one or lag. Okay, it's the movement difference per revolution between the tire and the shell. The easiest way to explain that I've had is um, a track meet, okay? So um, I always like to have examples that are easy to understand and easy to remember because there is too many things we have to remember on a daily basis. If you can remember a straw, if you can remember a tire parked on the curb, and you can remember a track run, right. that makes it a lot easier. Yeah. So let's oh, yeah. keep let's, it simple, right? Keep it simple. So. You got a tire at the top, okay, the tire's bigger. You got a shell at the bottom, the shell's smaller, okay? You got two guys, me and Mike, okay? Mike's on the outside, I'm on the inside. We both are running at the same speed, okay? I guess in this case, linearly. So let's say I'm going at five miles per hour and Mike's going at five. Mike and I are going at two miles per hour because that is a lot of running. Um, <laughs> I am older. <laughs> and I'm just out of shape. Right, right, I hear you. Um, if we go at the same speed, do you think you will end up in the in the front, or I'll end up in the front? Now, which and I was on the outside. You're on the outside. I'm gonna say I'm gonna end up. I'm not going to end up in the front. Right, right, right. I will win. Right. Yes. If we assume that the marker is in that way, okay. That's the same idea that your shell and tire do. It's it's real. It's moving the same speed, but the size is different. Okay. It's slightly smaller because you got the tire pad. You got the tire that's big the tire pad and you got the shell it's right. slightly different in size or slightly different in the sense that you got a outside the track and inside track it'll be a little bit slower or it'll, not slower it'll be a little bit less distance so after we go around the track once a distance is formed after your unit let's say you make a mark after it rotates one revolution and a distance forms that is called your creep I'm gonna pause you right there. Okay. Let's show because you mentioned mark and not everybody. Oh, okay, okay. Let's go through the mark. So this would be a mark. Okay. So you see that this is a a very very um, easy method, assuming you have access. Is you take a piece of uh, chalk or soapstone and you make a mark. 
This is the mark between the tire and the tire pad. And the reason why we mark the tire pad is, as you can see to the left of it, the tire pad is welded to the shell, okay? As long as those two marks are formed, after a revolution, those marks will start getting bigger and bigger. That distance is your creep. Now, real quickly, mm -hmm. if you don't mind, let's show them on the actual dryer. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. So, so we are gonna go to the dryer and show you guys where we're going to mark. Yes. Let's use this pen. We'll mark it on the pen. Okay, so let's see. Let's zoom on this one. No, this one will be easier to see. Here, I'll get up play. We're going to do this one. All right, sweet. Okay, so let's see if we can go in a little bit more. Okay, cool. So let's say um, this is actually a uh, anti-rotation type of unit because uh, if you go down, <laughs> this right here locks this tire to the shell, so you probably won't get creep. But if you were to measure it, this is a pad. Let's say that's a pad. That's your shell. That pad is welded to the shell, and that's the tire. You would actually take, let's see here, pretend like this is your substone. You make a mark like that. Okay, so uh, typically, <laughs> where's my, what do I do with my, oh, here, here. okay, so practically speaking, you're probably standing here, okay, so you're going to make a mark like this, okay, recommended on the upturning side, recommended on the upturning side, you don't want to do it on the downturning side, safety, so as you see on this mark, uh, here, when it rotates around, this mark will get where this is over here. So let's say it's one revolution, and this is something that changes. You'll see something like this, okay? From here to here, it's going to be a certain um, distance. distance. And you got to remember to count the revolution. After one revolution, this distance is going to be, let's say this is half inch. This is a half inch per revolution creep. Let's say you let it go again, another revolution. It's gonna be here now, okay? So it's gonna rotate, it's gonna be somewhere like this. Now this is one inch, but you got two revolutions, so one inch divided by two will be half inch. Typically, you, you, you will see it with the one revolution, and that's gonna be your number. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, and if you wanna, for me, I'll be anal about it. I'll actually let it rotate around and count uh, it and see what happens. They're saying they can't see the mark. Oh, you can't see the mark? Let's I see. wonder if the shine of the light. Yeah, let's see if we can zoom in a little bit more. How about the glare? Is there any way we can see an example? I hear a lot of, as you can see on this mark, but I can, can't can see what they're doing. Oh. And then he said he can't see the camera, period. Oh, okay. You might not have the webinar camera on, because this is a, one of the webinar cameras that we'll have. Um, but we'll we'll go ahead and talk a little bit about that in the presentation. Sure, sure. Because we have a we um, for some of you guys that can't see it, this is a uh, one of the webcams when you turn it on. So like if you see Mike and I on a webcam, you should see the dryer. So if you don't have that on, what we'll do is we'll talk about it on the um, presentation. presentation itself, so that so that we get a little bit better clarity. This was just easier to see sure. live, but we'll we'll go back and show you that on the presentation sure. itself. Okay, so let's go this Okay, so on the presentation itself, so the presentation should be coming up soon. Um, I can actually draw this mark. So let's say you mark this. Um, you should see the tire on the right the pad on the left, and a white chalk mark, okay? The idea is if it creeps, um, and it should typically creep. You definitely want some type of creep. You definitely want some kind of creep unless somehow it got attached. So I'm gonna see if I could make this draw. I'm gonna draw this on it. After one revolution, you should see something like this, okay? So this distance here, I don't like this color. Let's see if we can change it. No. Oh, here it is. Let's start this. 
So this is a mark. This is another mark. But let's say that's after one revolution. When you have this, this distance here is what you want to measure, okay? And let's say this is half an inch. I'm going to use this. Half an inch. And it's per revolution, okay? So after about, um, after one revolution, let's say you do this, you weigh two revolutions. So one is here, two should be somewhere, say, here. And this is maybe one inch, but it's two revolutions. When you divide that out, it's again half inch per revolution. That's what we were explaining for those of you um, that can't see the drum um, on how to measure creep. Right. Um, and Mike, like, uh, remember, um, Mike said you want to be on the upturning side because it's much safer, and you want to just you are physically touching a moving unit. So keep your safety in uh, mind, please. Okay, so let's go back to the, um, I, here we go. Okay, so this is an example on. So back to me losing the race. <laughs> back to you losing the race. So that's after one revolution. This is the conceptual viewpoint of it. Let's say this is after two revolutions, okay? So it gets bigger, but remember, you gotta take into consideration the revolution. So here's a here's an easy little calculator for it. Creep is equal to the distance between the two marks divided by the number of revolutions. If you have one revolution, it's very easy, half inch per one revolution. If you have two revolutions, it's one inch, one inch divided by two. Three revolutions, 1.5 divided by three. It should go up relatively smoothly. So if you wait five revolutions, whatever you get, divide by five. If you get 10 revolutions, now that is really long, because uh, I don't know my attention can deal with it that long well like I said a lot of times you're going to see with that first revolution yes so if you get just a little bit of movement yes then then typically everything's going to kind of progress the same you know now when you have a loose tire right right you know you're going to see it moving. then it's then it's pretty high right um I guess a, a natural question would be how do you measure it um it's it's a pain with a uh with the tape measure on there and it floats around and they'll get caught sometimes um, a method I do is I just use the I just use the chalk itself. I put the chalk up next to it and get the distance where where it ends, and then and then and then just measure that. A lot of times, if the unit's moving, now some of these units are moving a little bit quicker than others, but a lot of times you can use a uh, carpenter's ruler, mm. which, is the, which is more rigid. Yeah, and you can kind of get a feel. But I'd say most everyone watching can kind of gauge between half one yeah. inch. You know, yeah, typically on creep in this way, if you're in the inch, half inch, quarter of an inch, if you're really good, you can do eighth of an inch. That's about the resolution that I would expect. Okay. The main point here with creep is that most units, if you're above an inch per revolution in creep, it's time to at least plan on a repad. One of the things we talk about when we're on site, mm -hmm. anything at three quarter inch, when you start to see three quarter inch, uh, is when you need to start having discussions. Discussions, yes. And uh, even on the uh, survey uh, reports, when I do say an inch, right, it, it says plan for repad. It doesn't mean emergency. You need to shut the unit down. <laughs> you need this is just part of being proactive and, right. and doing more uh, preventive maintenance on it. Well, you want to get ahead of it, right? So temperature. How does temperature relate to it? Okay. Well, the easiest is when your shell gets hot it will get bigger and if it gets big enough then Mike and I are on the same line and we're running at the same spot so then as he and I run around um, we're not going to have that much distance actually if he and I are next to each other and running around and have zero then our creep will be zero inch per rep you normally don't want to have zero creep um, if the unit is designed to creep, if the unit is designed to not creep, that's its own separate discussion that we. Yeah, that's that's, that's, that's outside it's, of this. It's, it's designed for that. Right, and that'll be outside of what we're doing here today. A lot of times you see that with uh, low heat. Yeah, low heat, and low heat means under 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but yes, uh, uh, 
when you're creeping zero, that is not good. You want it to creep a little bit, but you don't want to creep so much that you're an inch or more. Right. right. Okay. So we talked about the chalk method. So to summarize the mechanical section, weight matters. Most of the design on the weights are really close to design limits. Um, some of the OEMs will be a little bit more beefier. Some will be a little bit less. Uh, desktop load studies that we do, we can help you know that. Survey baselines, if you don't know if your straw or your kiln is straight, this is a way you could do dad scans, you can do kiln access surveys that we offer service-wise to help you figure out where that is. Skew is not the same as an alignment. If you want to float, that is a very different service. If you're talking to a service provider, um, and it's a, and realistically, that is something that we would like to teach you to where you could do it on your own. And, and it's with float and alignment, I mean, just keep in mind, it's, it's more about float is where the unit's riding, uphill yeah. or downhill. And alignment is more in the along the lines of is is it on the design slope? Mm -hmm. Right. We got another question of for a smaller rotary dry, direct fire dryer unit, what are the negatives of not having creep? What adverse effects may occur? Oh, okay. hey, Woo! man, that's a good question. Okay. Okay, so so I'll, I'll go back to this example because I love that question. Okay, so the um, disadvantage of creeping is, let's say Mike and I are back on the track, okay? I am at the lower end of the track, and Mike is at the top end of the track. I would say we're handcuffed together, but I don't think they make handcuffs. Let's say we're chained together, Correct. okay? We're going to keep walking and walking and walking, okay? So we're going to have something eventually like this. Your shell will want to be away from the tire distance-wise. So I'm going to be trying to walk away from Mike and he's going to get further, further, further back. So eventually what happens? Um, either our hands get popped off or the chain breaks. So one of the negatives of something that doesn't creep, um, if your unit is designed to not creep, is eventually it will creep. Yeah, just wear. You got to remember, yeah, it, it, is is it is rotating. It's yeah. going to wear. The advantage of it is you you just, so one of the disadvantages of having a uh, unit that creeps is you have to change the pads and the shims. Right. That's a wear item. Well, if, well go ahead. Uh, if you don't have creep, you don't have that wear item. But the problem is you may crack your tire if it's connected to the tire and it fails. That's kind of the back and forth on it. You can see cracking. Uh, of the welds around the support pad, you mm -hmm. can see cracking of the tire. Mm -hmm. uh, you could actually coke bottle yes the shell yes uh, from the heat being too much and not having the creep. Right. So on the dryers on the eight foot units, I've seen uh, um, eight foot uh, dryers that doesn't creep, and uh, I I have seen um, those uh, um, what they call anti rotation blocks fail or getting worn in. And what that means is after, say, another six months or so, because those are relatively new dryers that I saw um, more in the frac sand market, um, I think those were six months to a year old, and they were already about to pop off. Right. So, like I said, if it doesn't creep, eventually it'll creep. No, knowing the heat of, the, of that particular unit for the question mm -hmm. is, is crucial. Yeah, that's going to be good, too. Hopefully that answers your question on that. I love talking about that topic. So if you if you get a hold of us, we can go more. Uh, we can go deeper there too. Um, okay, so we're gonna switch gears slightly, <laughs> or a lot. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna go through the process principles. We got just enough time to go through it. The main point here I want to make on the process principles is that kiln process and dryer process <laughs> function under two very different heat transfer mechanisms. One is radiation heat transfer dominant, and two, dryer is convection heat transfer dominant. What that means for you is how you make money, okay? The kiln is all about how the flame sees the bed. When that occurs well and that mixes well, you're making money, you're making the chemical reaction. On the dryer, everything is how you get the material into the hot air stream. Everything related to that. If you get rid of the moisture, if you get rid of the moisture more efficiently, that's how you make money. Okay, so this is a 
subtle but very, very crucial difference between a kiln and a dryer. This is also exactly why the kilns and the dryers have very different sizes and very different internals, et cetera, et cetera. And I talked about why. So I want to talk about two pieces related to the process. There's a lot more other things. I just want to talk about a couple. One is seals. Okay? And this is on a calciner. And this is a calciner. Um, calciner is actually uh, a smaller, and actually they have two different seals, one for the firebox and one for the process. And they're actually a little bit more complicated than um, some of the kilns. This one that you'll see is actually a kiln seal. Um, this had an issue where this is a leaf type seal where something got into it and it broke a whole bunch of seals. What you want to know on the seal, the major point, if you don't get anything on seals, the only one you know one thing is that seals are designed for air, not material. It's not a product seal. It's not a product seal. And you know what? I don't think many exist. And if they do, they're kind of expensive. Yeah, I was gonna say I've seen one outfit that does install them, and they're and it was in the cement industry, and it was extremely expensive. Right. And the thing is, if you put a material seal to deal with material coming out, you're actually fixing a symptom, not a problem. If you have material coming out, it is because you have material coming out um, from due to the way it's fed, or it's because you have a lot of material that has Exceeded the design time. Absolutely. Hey, Tom. Yes. Another question. Okay. How often should creep be checked? Oh, okay. That goes back to the preventative. Maintenance. Right. So if you don't have a problem, I was like once a week. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's really easy and simple to do. I mean it's just like if there's there's a handful of things that you can do uh, as a preventative maintenance program that you can check weekly. Uh, bi-weekly but like Tom said if there's not an issue you know maybe maybe a couple times uh, a month uh, mm -hmm. but if you've got a severe issue where you're seeing excessive creep have it done once a month or I mean once a week it, it doesn't take like right. I said it's a very simple or even more extreme once a day because if your process temperature changes then your creep will change um, if you so an example would be if your creep is right at zero you need to monitor that hourly almost or actually every other hour because you want to see that actually creep you want to see it actually move if it doesn't creep and it's still going on now you have to stick, uh, take a look at your process on why that is either typically it's because it's really but that's hot. for something if if you're seeing issues yes yeah, now if you don't see issues once a week is good if you have guys that are going around uh, putting lubrication in the bearings this is another eat or they or typically what i see is the guy checking the temperatures have them do some of Correct. this. Is yeah, good. yeah it's, it's pretty simple to do. Okay. Another question of can we get a list of preventative maintenance items and the frequency you recommend? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, yeah. yeah. We, 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 uh, we have fact, lists. Uh, even in our training guides, we, we do have some uh, preventative maintenance lists. Yeah, we, we typically will have a lot of those in our normal training programs, too. If you reach out to your CSR, okay. your CSR can provide that to you. Right, your your key account specialist, um, um, whatever local group, uh, whatever location you are, they will they will get that to you too. Yeah. Okay. So this is an example of um, air going through the seals and not doing its job. The more air goes, so this graph on the left is from left to right is more and more air percent excess air. The graph from bottom, uh, the the chart from bottom top is the temperature. The more air goes into your system, the less temperature it is. If it's less temperature, then typically that means your burner needs to be increased to heat up cold air. Oh yeah, now now you're losing the efficiency of the burner. You're right. You're wasting more on on gas. Right. Right. Uh, also, too, you're changing the chemical properties. If I'm, yeah. If I'm correct. Sometimes it's right at. Let's say you're at 1600 degrees to change limestone to lime and uh, quick lime, and you do this, and you're at 1500. And now you don't have your chemical reaction. Right. Now you don't make money. Okay. So seal replacements are good, but just remember when you do change the seals, make sure that you put a what do you call it? The, the rings that you keep it true, keep it keep the run out. Riding rings. Riding, riding rings on that seal because if it's all oblong and it's high run out on a shell, you'll wear the seals out a little bit faster. Yeah, and again, just what people got to remember, seals and 
things like that, they are replacement parts. Yes, yes, they will, they are replaceable. Main thing again is seals are there to give you better control of the airflow and the process, okay? Because if you, you're, you're just reduce, you're just throw money away, really. Yeah. And, and the main thing is if your financial models are enough where you don't care to throw away money and do um, better things, then great. Yeah. If not, then this is an, what I call low hanging fruit to help you with your process. Um, I mean, we did a study um, in the in in another industry where they didn't control the seals, and then it caused the burner to go up, and then they burn out their combustion chamber. And I think wow. it was like half million to million dollar fix. We had another question that says, "Is tramp air through seals really a problem if your excess O2 is good and your draft BT is good?" You for that that means uh, you got a lot of air going through, so that sounds like a dryer. Um, then it's mainly a cost standpoint. So if you got 50,000 CFM and you got 5,000 CFM of tramp air, what I would suggest is figure out what the cost of that 5,000 CFM is. If that costs you $500 a day over 365 days, let's do that math. 500, 365, $180,000 a year. If that is not that much for you, then that's fine. If um, So if it's 180,000 and you're trying to reduce costs, then that's something you should uh, justify for. It depends on if it financially makes sense, right? If you're doing that and you're losing 50 cents a day and it comes out at five grand, okay, no harm, no foul. Well, no the process too. Right, and, and no the process, so if you can, if you can make a gain out of it, and that's where we can help you on ROI right. and those types of things, then it's driven by a financial model. And I think that's probably where everyone can benefit from. Well, but that's where, you know, like for Optimus or competitive mm -hmm. advantage comes into play and yeah. stuff like that. So. Yeah, absolutely. Flighting. So this is a, a pretty much one of the final topics here is flighting is there to do something. Okay, and that something typically means it wants the material to fail into the atmosphere for a direct heat, direct fire unit because it's convection. Now, for calciner, it may be through the shell. The top one is a calciner view. It may just have some mixing flights. It's there to break the material up or give as much exposure to the material as possible. Each flighting has its reasons and it's designed to help maximize the exposure to the heat or maximize the exposure to a certain surface. Yeah, it, it's, it's definitely just picking it up through the, through the heat and mm -hmm. different stages of the heat. Right, and, and this is where uh, you can go through and um, um, we have, have a way where we can do some 3D modeling, uh, 3D printer modeling where you oh, can yeah. go through. That stuff is cool. Maybe we'll, we'll do one of those uh, on one of our next sessions. We'll put one of those. Yeah, that'd be in there. Sweet. That stuff's always cool to see. Production increase. So most of the time, so this is one of the final things here, is most of the time people want to increase the production by adding speed. Speed, trying to speed up the kiln. Try to speed up the kiln. Everything. You name it. And then what happens? Then we get a phone call. It's what happens. Because um, Uh, product, you don't do anything to your flies, you get back spill. You get back spill, your seals get damaged, you get seals get damaged, now you get transfer in the system, you increase the RPM, then your wear gets accelerated. Some of the groups have changed the slope. That makes it really tough. You start clogging up, uh, you mm -hmm. start, you're not getting moisture out of the material. Right. And there's a balance, and residence time changes, so if residence time changes, um, for lightweight aggregate, maybe it's not enough time to blow. Maybe it's not time uh, enough uh, time to dry. Maybe it's not time to do the chemical reaction. Right. These are the consequences. And my view a lot of times is it's not that it's bad or good. It's how does that affect your key performance metrics? If you don't have any, we're more than happy to help you baseline those key performance metrics. How do you know it's good? And how do you know it's good connected to a financial model? Um, if you do this, and you can gain half a million dollars a year out of it, and the cost is an extra 20,000, that's good. 
your ROI is very good as within a few days. Right, right. If it doesn't make sense, it's half a million dollars and it costs you half a million dollars, okay, that's within a year. Some groups that's good, some groups that's bad. It depends on your business, it depends on your level of um, risk, it depends on the market. There's a lot of things that it depends on. And I think it would be very arrogant of us to say that, yeah, this is good, you should do this, but there's a lot of factors. You, yeah, you surely don't want to just assume the equipment's going to be able to handle right. the increase. I mean, it could right. be, you end up with a whole lot more problems. Like right. That. So for the process summary portion, heat transfer dictates the equipment, radiation versus convection, and actually conduction for calciners that we haven't covered. Seals, air seals, not material seals. <laughs> seals mean better process control and efficiency, which ultimately helps you lower costs. How much? That is dictated by your financial models and your market. Lighting for normally rotor dryer is typical of feature of rotor dryers. Refractory is more common in kilns, and the straight flights are more common in rotor calciners. And it for rotor drives, all it does is make sure your material has the maximum exposure to the air possible. Well, on, and real quick, I okay. know we're running out of time, but on the seals and the flighting, those are really typically, some, and most flighting too, are inexpensive items to replace yes. and stay on top of. You you, um, you um, bolt on some new ones typically, and now if you have the weld type, that's its own story. Yeah, but I mean, again, for, for what we're talking about and, and, and at the end of the day, it's about churning out product yes. and, and keeping things going and, yes. and, and efficiently. Absolutely. And these are small items or lower. You either want to uh, sell more or reduce costs. Okay, so overall summary. Overall summary. This is, we've got a few slides left. I, wow. Okay. <laughs> we only have a certain amount of time it left. It goes by. It goes by. Quick. Equipment type. Equipment type is dictated by the heat transfer in the process. You learn uh, direct fire, direct heat, indirect heat, Kilns, which is dryers, kilns, dryers, calciners. A few of the mechanical principles we talked about is load design. Load design matters if you want to change refractor, if you want to change flight, if you want to change production. Load design because OEMs tend to design close to the limit. If you don't know the alignment, get a survey, get the data, get the data so it helps you because if you have a heavy misalignment, you will get a circumferential Again, crack. Again, an inexpensive item. Heavy. Inexpensive compared to repairing a circumferential Absolutely. crack. Skew float, car on the hill. Car on the hill, alignment, straw. You should learn how to do this. If you don't, call us, we'll help you. We'll, we'll get you guys to where you know what to do. Pre, most kilns is one inch per, per rev. Dryers similar to, if it's in that range, Plan for a repad. Pads are meant to be a warehouse for yeah. discussion. Um, the non-pads and all those systems, we can we can sidebar that to a separate sure, discussion. Go into the some of the process principles again: mm -hmm. radiation, convection, heat transfer. Those dictate the system size, system mechanism, system process. Air seal, not material seal. Lighting improves convection for rotary dryers. So this is just some of the information we have. If you have a deeper question, um, you can contact us at industrialkill.com. Um, we have the contact information. What I will do is um, this is the current regional training seminar. When you get the new one, please go ahead and sign up for the next one. The next one will be, I think I'll do the next one and we'll go through a lot of the process yeah, principles. Okay. Um, hold on, it's going away. We got a question. We got a question. What is the minimum measurement of the thickness of the sheet of a kiln? On the shell? Sheet. Um, well, for if that is the shell, the lowest on the span on the kiln is typically an eighth of an inch. In the heavy section, you can go from half an inch to an inch to two inches. To figure out how thin you can go before mechanically you have issues, I have done load studies where I decrease the thickness until, so for the shell, you have a um, shell limit of about 3,000 PSI. That's an industry limit. And one of the things I, I have done is you can take that thickness and decrease it to the point where it exceeds that 3,000 limit. That is 
but that's different for every unit. So I'm not sure what the limit is or what the units and those details, but but feel feel free to uh, send us some uh, yeah, send contact some, information. We'll, we'll get some more information, and we can go through a little bit more detail with you. So you guys will be getting another email coming out. Um, you can click here to join the webinar on, on the on the April 9th um, webinar. But if you want to contact us, if you click on this logo, it will actually show up Industrial Kiln um, website. And you can either go in contacts with a quote or um, down here you have our local address and everything okay that's for contacting now let's don't forget how to show them how to sign up for the next Did you right that? yeah 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 okay. the next one um you'll get a new email like this and you just click register and join the webinar for the following uh webinar april 9th and on that one we'll dive a little bit deeper into process on the combustion seals sliding bag house etc um it'll be a new way There'll be a new link. We'll send it out via eblast. It'll be via eblast. So again, for our emails. Um, one quick thing: you guys are an essential business, especially with the pandemic out there. We are too. We are here to support you guys. This industry, all the industries we deal with, typically are there to support the general economy, the general people. Your toilet papers, your Lysol wipes all those things come from somewhere and those things are from you guys and to me uh and to all of us we're very proud to help you guys out absolutely. to help our people absolutely so we appreciate you guys taking the time to join us today we appreciate um, hopefully we helped hopefully we help this is something we typically do regionally um so we are very fortunate that we have the technologies here to where we can give this information and get this information to you um, with that, we appreciate it. Anything? Appreciate it, guys. Look, um, if there's anything we can do, contact us. We'll do what we can. Right. I think we got a few minutes. If there's any final questions that you guys see, we can go ahead and answer. Um, you guys got any more? No. Well, overall, hey, we appreciate it. Thank you for your time. And, oh, oh, we oh. got one more question. What is the correlation between tire creep and ovality? Ovality? So, okay, so. Quick. Oh, okay. So to um, tire creep and ovality, um, the higher the tire creep, typically the higher the, um, it means it's looser between the shell and the tire, and typically that means a little bit more flexing. Um, if for the ovality, typically what you look for is the refractory, because if the refractory is not all there or, or it's uh, um, new or it's it's in good shape, your shell will flex. So ovality is a is is a relationship for the refractory damage. It's also a relationship for the stiffness between the tire tire pad and the shell. So that from a creep standpoint, if you go higher in creep, you will typically see higher in ovality. That's normally a correlation. It doesn't necessarily mean it's directly impacted. Right. Somebody else asked if we could turn on the dryer. <laughs> okay, we will turn on. We will yeah. turn on the dryer. Actually, we will just turn it on, and you'll just listen to the amount of noise it'll make. Go ahead, Mike. If I remember right. Yep. Look okay. <laughs> at. There's the laundry motor sounding dryer. <laughs> okay. Hey, well, again, guys, we appreciate it. Um, this will be the end of this session. So peace out, guys. Peace out. Stay safe. Stay safe. Social distance.